Um, it is my honor tonight to uh, introduce our speaker for the week. Um, I met Pastor Longway a few years ago when uh, he and his brother showed up at my house uh, here in Chattanooga, and Joan and I were thrilled to meet uh, some people of color who had a Scottish accent, and we were a little confused. Uh, uh, Scottish and Reformed and uh, loving the Lord. And in God's providence, uh, a year or two ago, Joan and I went to spend five months in London. Uh, and right around that time, uh, Pastor Longway uh, received a call to be the pastor of London City Presbyterian Church. So we had the opportunity while we were there to go hear him preach, to visit with his congregation. He even invited me to preach, uh, took the risk. Um, and so thankful that he answered our call to come and be our speaker this year. So please welcome uh, Pastor Andy Longway. Brother, thank you so much for that welcome. Um, I got a visit with Randy a couple of years back, and it was a life-changing experience to hear of a brother and Joan, a sister in the Lord, who have just served the Lord so faithfully, and uh, God has used them mightily here in Chattanooga, but way further afield, and even to Scot a black Scotsman uh, in London. Well, if you've got a copy of God's Word, let me invite you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. It may take you a little while to attune to my accent, so I'm from Glasgow in Scotland, uh, or just south of Glasgow, so I've got a thick Scottish accent, so if you need to pray for the gift of tongues, uh, or interpretation, maybe tonight's the night. Okay, Ephesians chapter 2. You, you, I, I'm going to assume that many of you know a lot about this letter. You've heard it said that it's split into two sections, chapter 1 through 3, the gospel indicatives, the facts of the gospel, chapters 4 through 6, the gospel imperatives, the commands of the gospel. The only thing about that understanding is that it, it misses the fact that in the passage we will look at it tonight in chapter 2, there are two commands. And we're tonight going to remember who we once were before we came to Christ. Paul commands us twice as he unpacks the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to remember. Let's read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 to 22. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that He might create in Himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And He came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through Him we both have access in one Spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus Himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In Him, 
you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Amen. And thanks be to God for this reading from His Holy Word. One month and 30 years ago, almost to the day, a remarkable event took place here in the United States of America. It was the 13th of September, 1993. The then President of the United States of America, Bill Clinton, welcomed into the White House two sworn enemies. Their names? Yasser Arafat, the then leader of the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, and Yitzhak Rabin, the then Prime Minister of Israel. These two men had spent their entire lives trying to kill one another. And on that famous and historic day, President Bill Clinton welcomed them into the White House to sign a peace treaty known as the Oslo Accord. It was a peace treaty that promised to inaugurate a new epoch of peaceful coexistence between Israel and Palestine. No one could hardly believe that these men were standing together in the south lawn of the White House. And as they put pen to paper and signed the Oslo Accord, all the onlookers stood in open mouth amazement. They could hardly believe their eyes. And with the ink still fresh on the paper, the most jaw-dropping, heart-stopping thing happened. These two men sealed that historic peace agreement with a handshake. Not just once, but twice. The handshake, the photo of the handshake went viral, as we would say, all across the world. It was plastered on every front page of newspapers all across the globe. That handshake powerfully captured the hope of so many Israelis and Palestinians at that time. They wanted a peaceful resolution to their centuries-old conflict. It was so powerful. It was such a momentous moment that one year later, both those men were awarded with the Nobel Peace Prize for their efforts in making peace in the Middle East. And yet, here we are, 30 years later, almost to the day, and there is no peace in the Middle East. All the, the peace treaty, the handshake, the Nobel Peace Prize, all but a dim and distant memory now. I suspect, like me, you're, you're reeling from the, the scenes that you're witnessing on your television screens and your phone of what's happening there right now. It's nearly impossible to take in. And one of the reasons it's so difficult to take in is that is because it feels like we just go from one conflict to another, one catastrophe to another. You know, over the last two decades, we've become accustomed to seeing images on our TV screens of bombed-out cities, burnt-out cars, men and women and children lying wounded on makeshift beds and makeshift hospitals. Afghanistan. Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Ukraine, Russia, Congo, Sudan, and I could go on and on. You know, the, the conflict in the Middle East tonight is just a tiny snapshot of the conflict that is going on across all the world, even a conflict that's going on in this country and in my country protests, riots, uh, conflicts not just in terms of war, but conflicts in our schools, in our politics, conflicts in our homes, and dare I say it, conflicts that even exist in our churches. 
We are living in a world of conflict. I believe it was in March of this year that Randy asked me to be the speaker at this conference. I couldn't believe that he asked me. I'm just a regular pastor in the heart of London, and I'd heard of the faith and love of this church for the saints. And so, to be invited to this conference, I was deeply hum- humbled. And I remember him saying to me, so I'm, I'm thinking the theme for the conference, it'd be good if you could preach on proclaiming the gospel of peace in a world of conflict. And I thought to myself, and there's a sound of sirens to remind us. <laughs> and I thought to myself, proclaiming the gospel of peace in a world of conflict, that's a great suggestion. But little did I know and little did he know that that was actually a prophetic suggestion. If there was ever a time you and I needed to be reminded of our call as Christians to proclaim the gospel of peace into a world of conflict, now is that time. If the church of Jesus Christ is not relevant in times like this, then the church of Jesus Christ is not relevant at all. And the glorious reality is we have been entrusted with the glorious gospel message that Jesus Christ was born as a babe in that war-torn country of Israel as the Prince of Peace, to come and bring peace between us and God and between one another. Tonight, we are going to set our hearts and our minds on this glorious gospel of peace. The angels sang when Jesus was born, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth toward all men. Tonight, we're going to fix our eyes and our hearts on the glorious gospel of peace, which has triumphed where no peace treaty or peace mission has in the past been able to inaugurate a new epoch of peaceful coexistence. My heart's prayer for us this week is that as we give our minds to this glorious theme, it would reignite our love for our Savior, reignite our love for the church, reignite our passion for mission, and reignite our calling to make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Let me just pray that right now. Our God and our Father, as we come and as we open up Your Word, we pray that You would now open up our eyes to see Your Son and what He achieved at the cross. Open up our hearts to receive the truth of Your Word. Open up our souls to Your Spirit's work. Oh God, we pray that tonight you would rend the heavens and send forth your Spirit into this place in power. We pray that you would open up our ears because we want to hear the voice of Jesus preaching peace to us tonight. And we pray this in his glorious name. Amen. In Ephesians chapter 1, Pastor Paul prays, and he prays for the Christians in Ephesus, that God would, by His Holy Spirit, enlighten the hearts of the believers there so that they would know the hope to which they've been called. And in many ways, it's it's the most brilliant prayer because Paul is praying not only that they would know the gospel better, but they would know God more. It's a wonderful pastor's prayer. But what's fascinating is is as we get to chapter 2, Paul's not content. Paul's not satisfied with just praying that they would know the gospel better. Paul immediately realizes he's the answer of his own prayer because he sets before the Ephesian Christians in this letter the glorious truth of what was achieved in the gospel. Now, you know chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. I suspect some of you have memorized it. You know that glorious formula that Paul uses, once you were this, but now you're this. Once you were dead in your sins and transgressions, now you're alive, raised, seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. Once you were by nature objects of God's wrath, but now you are objects of God's love. 
Once you were enslaved by the passions of the flesh, the sinful desires of the mind, but now, as God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus, you're to walk in the good works that He's prepared for you to do. It's one of the most compelling and clear statements of the gospel in the entire New Testament. But as we get a verse 11, Paul is not content that we would just understand one dimension of the gospel. That is our vertical reconciliation. We've got to have a comprehensive understanding of the gospel. We've not just been vertically reconciled with God, personally reconciled to God. We have also been reconciled with one another in Christ Jesus, corporately reconciled to God in Christ Jesus. And so that's what we are going to look at this evening. And Paul uses that famous formula once again. Once you were far from God's people, far from God, but now you've been brought near to God's people, near to God. Once you were without God, but now God dwells in you. Three points. Remember, recognize, realize. Remember that you were once far off from God's people and far off from God. Secondly, recognize. Recognize that Christ has brought you near to God's people and near to God. And thirdly, realize. Realize that you're now one new humanity in Christ Jesus, and God dwells within us. As Paul wrote this letter, he's he's a Jew. Jew by birth, Jew by upbringing, and he's writing to a church that was mainly made up of Gentiles. His purpose is to help them know and understand the gospel better. And as Paul writes to them, he wants them to understand how amazing it is that God in His glorious purposes has brought the Gentiles and united them to His own people. If you've got a Bible there, you could just look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6, just over the page. This mystery is that the the mystery of the gospel that Paul's been writing about, this is a mystery that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. One of the things that had been kept hidden for generations was now revealed by the Holy Spirit to the apostle, like Paul, that the Gentiles were heirs of the same family, partakers of the promise. Now, in verse 11, Paul calls them, first of all, to remember that they were far off from God's people. In the first century, every Jew looked at the world and said, there are are only two categories of people. They are the Jews, us, God's chosen people, the circumcised. And then there are the Gentiles, not God's chosen people, the uncircumcised. And what we've got to understand is that between these two people groups, there existed the greatest gulf, as wide as the Grand Canyon. And Paul wants us to understand that that gulf was also filled with deep division and hostility. Let me give you a flavor of it. A Jewish man woke up every morning and prayed, I thank God that I was born a Jew and not a Gentile. A Jewish man, if you heard him speaking about a Gentile, he he wouldn't even say that he was a human. He would say he was a filthy dog, wild, untamed. If you ask a Jewish man, so why did God create the Gentiles? God created the Gentiles so that they could be the fuel for the fires of hell. You get a feeling of the the fierce hostility, the deep division. Now, Paul wants us to see that as he writes as a pastor to these Gentiles, he wants to, to remind them of that deep division. He wants to remind them as Gentiles, they were far off from God's people. And so, do you know what he does? He does. 
he brings back to mind one of the most derogatory nicknames that the Jews had for the Gentiles. Do you notice that he says, the uncircumcised, but note that it's in inverted commas. Do you remember in the Old Testament, Israel's at war with the Philistines. Young David goes up against Goliath the giant. And do you remember what he turns and says to the army of Israel? Why are we letting this uncircumcised Philistine talk to us like this? You've got to understand, to say as a Jew to a Gentile, you're uncircumcised, it was a slur. It was a slander. It was an insult. It was to say, you are not God's people. You are hell-bound. You are not deserving of God's blessing, not deserving of God's love. It was such a loaded term that it was centuries old for the Jews. And by mentioning it, Paul was seeking to remind these Gentiles, you are not one of God's people. You know, as we, we look into the mirror of God's Word tonight, I think it would be appropriate for us to remember here, and I'm going to assume that the majority of us here we're not born as Jews, born Gentiles. You and I were born not as God's chosen people. Remember that. Because it's so easy if you, if you grew up in church with one of the blessed upbringings, to get puffed up with pride, to do what the Jews did, to look down your noses in self-righteous judgment on others because of their differences. How many of us look at unbelieving people in our world, and it's with the same air of superiority that the Jews here showed to the Gentiles? How many of us can make judgments based on externals? Look, they, they, they based their judgment of the Gentiles, the Jews, that is, on the fact that they were not circumcised. And, and it's so clear in verse 11, right, that Paul, even as he mentions that fact, that he, he actually is such a wise pastor that he wants also, if there's any Jewish Christian in the church in Ephesus, to remember that their circumcision, it shouldn't have been used as a badge of honor to create deep division or hostility towards the Gentiles, because their circumcision, verse 11, was done by the hands of men. Do you know what circumcision, in part, was a sign of? It was a sign that the hardened hearts of the Jews needed inward circumcision, not by the hands of men, but by the hands of God. It was a gift of God's grace to say to the Jews, you need saved as well. You know, one of the greatest ironies of life is we often look down on people who we've got more in common with than we realize. People might be different from us based on color of skin, socioeconomic status. But remember, we're all image bearers of God. Remember, we all possess sinful hearts. We've often got more in common than what we often have drive us apart. So Paul says, remember. And do you know why I think he really drives home this point to remember? It's because when you remember who you are, there's no grounds for self-righteous judgment. There's no grounds for being puffed up with pride. So, verse 11, remember you were far off from God's people. Verse 12, Paul says, remember you were far off from God. Now, John Stott summarizes the list that Paul gives in, in verse 12 as this devastating description of the Gentile state. They were Christless. They were stateless. They were friendless. They were without hope and without God. Let's just take one of them. They were Christless. Do you know in the context of Ephesians, that is the, 
That is the worst position to be in. Because Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. To have Jesus Christ, to be in Christ, is to have everything. Therefore, by logical deduction, not to have Christ is to have nothing. If I could put verse 12 in a word, it is a picture of living hell. To be without Christ is to be hell-bound. And Paul says, Gentile Christians, remember, you are not just far off from God's people, you were without Christ, without hope, without God. The day that you and I forget that there was a time in our life that we were without Christ, it's a day that you and I will fail to appreciate how amazing our God is and how amazing His grace is. Do you know one of the reasons why I think Paul tells us to remember? It's because this is one of the most glorious motivations for mission. <laughs> when you remember that you were once just like your unbelieving neighbor today, if God saved you, if God made you who were once an object of His wrath, an object of His love, who took you who were once dead in your sins and transgressions and made you alive, and when you remember what He did for you, you can do it for them. This is a glorious motivation for mission. So we've remembered the Gentiles were once far off from God's people. They were once far off from uh, God. But then secondly, let's recognize. Paul in verse 13 wants us to recognize that those who were once far off have been brought near. Verse 13 is one of the most glorious verses in all of the New Testament. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of the cross. This is the wonder of the gospel. We who were far off have been brought near. At the heart of the, the, the work of bringing us near to God's people and to God stands the cross where Jesus shed His blood so that we could be reconciled to God and one another. Now, just let's think about the gospel here, right? For us to come near, God in Christ had to come near to us, right? In the incarnation. For us to come near, God had to come in Christ near to us. He had to become man so that He could die in our place as our substitute for our sin. Now, now, now listen to this. This leaves me speechless. When I reflect on the cross of Christ, humanly speaking, the, only, the reason Jesus was put to death was because the Jews and the Gentiles who had this deep hostility decided to set it aside for a moment so that they could kill the Lord of glory. The Jews and the Gentiles set aside their differences and their hostility so that they could kill the Lord of glory. All humanity united in violence against God. But here's an even greater thought. At the cross, when we see Jesus dying, his death struck the death blow to our sin, to Satan. He crushed the head of the serpent, and he was crushed for our iniquities. At the cross, as we see Jesus dying, he struck the death blow to the hostilities that exist between Jew and Gentile so that they could become one in him. <laughs> 
brought near to one another and brought near to Him. I just love the paradoxes of the cross. He had to die to bring you and I life. He had to make war on sin so that there could be peace in this world. He had to face the hostility of Jew and Gentile together so that He could bring them together in love and unity. What a magnificent peace mission! <laughs> the reverse of the curse, the gospel great reversal. Paul wants us to see it. That's why it's once you were this, but now you're this, all because of Christ. What mankind intended for evil, He intended for good. Now, verse 14 through 18 is actually just a commentary on verse 13. It's just the explanation of verse 13. Jesus Himself is our peace. Paul wants us to get that peace is not a process. Peace is a person. Jesus is our peace. Our world does not realize this, but what it desperately needs is not more peace treaties, not more peace missions. What our world desperately needs is more Jesus. The, the, the conflicts of our world cannot be fixed by the governments of Washington or Westminster. The conflicts of our world can only be fixed by the shed blood of the cross. And so, church, what does that mean for you and I? Well, we need to be passionate about the glorious proclamation of the gospel of peace. Jesus says the peace my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as this world gives to you. You see, the peace of Christ is the fullness of God's richest and highest blessing. Now, one of the most incredible things, this is, the thing that, this is another thing that just leaves me rendered speechless when I think about it. Jesus could have asked the angels to be the messengers of the gospel of peace, and they would have done a far better job than you and I. Facing a task unfinished that drives us to our knees, Often our problem is, is we're so slothful, we're so tired, that we can't even get down to pray. But Jesus chose you and I to be His instruments to make known this glorious message of the gospel. Paul, in another letter, puts it like this, 2 Corinthians 5, for we have this ministry of reconciliation. God was in Christ at the cross, reconciling all this world to Himself, entrusted us the message of reconciliation, and therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. God making His appeal through us, we implore others on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. God's entrusted the work of mission to you and I, because God wants people who were once deeply divided, once far off, to do that, because the gospel's not just taught, the gospel's caught. You know, one of the most amazing realities is I'm a Scotsman ministering in England. <laughs> like our, our nation, our little island of Britain has centuries-old division. I'm a black man ministering to a majority of white congregation. Right now in Israel, there are Arab Christians ministering the gospel in Hebrew to Jews. <laughs> Do you know that in, in the war in Ukraine, that many of the Ukrainians who have fled, some of them have finding, found themselves going to Russia, and they've met Russian-born, Russian-speaking Christians who have proclaimed the gospel of peace to them? Where else would you find that but the church of Jesus Christ? Because the gospel is taught and the gospel is caught by a people who become the living embodiment of what Christ died to achieve. 
He brought us near to God and near to Himself so that we could be one and put on full display the glorious gospel. There is neither Jew, there is now neither Jew or Gentile, male or female. There is neither slave or free man. All are one in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to see this, right? In verse 17, Paul tells us how the gospel of peace goes forth. It says, Jesus preached the gospel to those who were far and to those who were near. You've got to ask the question, when did Jesus go to Ephesus? Well, I've read the Gospels. I've read the book of Acts. He never went to Ephesus. He went to Ephesus through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Jesus Christ preaches peace through you and me. Jesus Christ preaches through you and me. You want a motivation for mission? That's the motivation. You become the mouthpiece. He's the preacher. That's incredible. That's why angels don't need to do this task. We need to do this task. Because He wants to work through you and work through me. And what's the consequence? Verse 18, so that together, Jew and Gentile, now made one, can be brought near to God the Father have access to the God the Father in one spirit. It's incredible. It is mind-blowing. Now, this is what I also want to say. Jesus doesn't just preach through you and me. He preaches through the church. I want you to do something tonight. There's missionaries, there are people from different countries, but I want you just to look around the church tonight. Just, just look around at one another. I know you see people who might look similar to you, and you'll see some people who look different from you, all different ages and stages and sizes, different backgrounds. Do you know that our diversity, coupled with our unity, is one of the most compelling, compelling reasons to believe? What brings all of us here together tonight is Jesus. You know, our world, they, they look at the world, they, they look around and, and they get segregation, they get separation. But you know what they don't get? When you see this incredible and this beautiful oneness. Jesus Christ preaches through us and he preaches through his church. How will the world know that he's sent of the Father by our love one for the other? Now, very, very briefly, the third point, and this is actually the most mind-blowing point. We who were once far off from God and from His people have been brought near, but the gospel doesn't end there. We who were once without God have now become God's dwelling place. And we who have been made one are now a new family a new kingdom, a temple. So, verse 19, he says, this, this, this amazing, amazing statement, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. I'm not an American, but I love when I hear the president of America say, my fellow Americans. It's a spine-tingling statement just in the sense that it captures that who you are as a nation, you are together. Hear the Apostle Paul. He says, we are fellow citizens with the saints. There's nothing that beats that. We who were once far off, we who once were not God's people, we're now fellow citizens with the saints. There's no second-class citizens. There's nobody in the kingdom of God who's got dub dubious immigration papers. We are fellow citizens. And then he says, and not only that, but we're family. We're brother and sister. The blood of Christ shed for us is thicker than the blood, biological blood that runs through your veins. 
God has become our Father. Jesus has become our big brother. And this is the most amazing reality of the part of the family of God. We all have the same inheritance. But here's the most mind-blowing reality. The third picture is where God's temple. There's no more physical temple. There is now the church made up of living stones being cemented together by the master builder. We, we are now the temple. So when I said, look around at one another, and what do you see? I'll tell you what you see. You see God's dwelling place. You, you see the miracle of salvation. You were once without God. You are now God's dwelling place. And that's why the second command in the book of Ephesians is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. And you know what that says? Therefore, I, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to live your lives in a manner worthy of the gospel. How do you do that? Make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Jesus Christ tore down the dividing wall of hostility that existed between Jew and Gentile so that He could build up the Father's house with people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And now that we are one, we've got to make every effort, every effort, to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So as we begin this missions conference, we begin it by reminding ourselves of the greatest peace mission to ever take place. We, remind, we begin by reminding ourselves of the greatest peace treaty ever signed and sealed, the one signed and sealed not with a handshake but with the precious blood of Jesus. We begin this week by remembering our mission is motivated by remembering remembering who we once were, recognizing who we've now become, and we begin this mission conference eager to maintain. The unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, because brothers and sisters, that is the most mind-blowing witness to this watching world. They see God in that. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so sorry that sometimes we fail to realize the, and grasp the full wonder of the gospel of peace. We thank you that you've given us this week so that we can recalibrate our minds and recalibrate our hearts to the message that you've entrusted us to proclaim. We pray that even tonight, as Christ has preached through me, that you would preach through us, this congregation gathered here. Lord, preach your sermon so that those who don't yet know you would come to know the wonder of the life in God in Christ Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.